This is no Hollywood blockbuster. We are talking real-life helicopter escapes from maximum security prisons. In these mind-boggling true stories, our escapees take to the sky, turning the idea of a jailbird on its head. They've swapped the ship for a chopper, making the great escape an airborne spectacle. And these are not flights of fancy. The audacity, the adrenaline, and the meticulous planning. These jaw-dropping stories of airborne escapes will shatter your notion of what's possible. Strap in and hold tight, because we're about to take off. On March 25, 1999, John Killick was waiting in Silverwater's jail exercise yard. Killick knew what was coming, or, more exactly, who was coming. At 57 years old, Killick was still very young at heart, and he was head over heels in love with an unusual woman, a 41-year-old librarian named Lucy Dudko. There was only one reason Killick was waiting in the exercise yard. Lucy was coming to rescue him. The couple had hatched a plan to get Killick out, and March 25th was the big day. Killick and Dudko met sometime in the mid-90s while at a party. The two of them fell hard for each other, despite their apparent differences. Dudko, who had a thick accent, was a Russian-Australian librarian. She had a slight frame and a kind face. Nothing about her appearance pointed to her inner strength, her resourcefulness, and dubious morals. As for Killick, he was a career criminal. Killick's childhood had been a comfortable one, but it all changed when he turned 17 years old and his mother committed suicide. That very day, Killick decided to leave home and make his own luck. Seven months later, he was in juvie. The first experience didn't determine Killick to seek out a more righteous lifestyle. In 1966, the man started his long career as a bank robber. He needed the easy money to fund his gambling addiction. As such, he acquired quite the reputation, becoming Australia's first decimal currency bank robber. Not even meeting Lucy Dudko was enough to get the man to settle down for long. In fact, maybe that was part of the attraction. While Killick was definitely a skilled robber and a dangerous man, he was widely regarded as a gentleman. He had never physically hurt anyone. Once Killick and Dudko met, they embarked on an affair before moving to Canberra. Soon after, police came knocking. Years before, Killick had violated parole there and authorities wanted him back in jail for it. It didn't matter what the authorities wanted. Killick and Dedko were together. They were in love and nothing was going to tear them apart. The couple took off, leaving everything else behind. To make a living, John Killick began doing what he knew best, robbing banks. But the man's luck ran out and he was arrested and imprisoned in Silverwater Jail in Sydney. Killick and Dudko's romance didn't fade away. They stayed together through thick or thin. At one point, while Killick was appearing at a courthouse hearing in Queen Bean in southeast New South Wales, Dudko suggested she could break him out of custody. She had a gun, and she was ready to break all hell loose in order to help her beloved. But John Killick told Lucy Dudko to abandon the plan. It was too risky. Instead, the two of them hatched a better plan. They had plenty of time. Dudko would visit Killick three times a week at his prison. That's when they came up with the idea to use a helicopter. Silverwater Jail was the perfect ground, both literally and figuratively, for an escape by helicopter. Some believe the prison guards may be too easily used as an airplane landing pad when Silverwater was first erected and later rebuilt for about $84 million. The prison's perimeter was once patrolled by armed guards, but they were retired in 1995 and replaced with security cameras. Security cameras, as you might have guessed, aren't able to shoot any would-be escapees. As Killick waited in the exercise yard, Lucy Dedko was carrying out her plan. She was determined to free her boyfriend, no matter the cost. On the morning of March 25, 1999, Lucy booked a helicopter joyride. The pilot, Tim Joyce, was to take her over the so-called Harbor Bridge track, which included the Olympic Stadium and Village. Sydney Harbor, and Manly. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Dudko's request. With the Sydney Olympics only a year away, many tourists booked flights near the site. What was unusual about Dudko, the pilot noticed, was she had four shopping bags with her. Still, the woman seemed harmless enough. The helicopter took off, and Tim Joyce, the pilot, started his usual routine. He began offering tidbits of educational commentary about the track. He attempted small talk and small remarks about the sites. But his passenger, Lucy Dedko, was far from interested in what the man had to say. Instead, she was fussing, agitated, and looking for something inside her shopping bags. As they neared the Olympic site, Dedko's interest was piqued. 
Was that a prison just ahead? She asked the man. Then, Dudko asked Joyce to fly around the prison. She wanted to get a better look. Joyce flew around the prison's perimeter. Dudko kept looking for something in her bags. And then, she finally found what she was looking for. The woman got out a two-shot Derringer pistol. She pointed it at the pilot's head. This is a hijack, she told him. Joyce immediately tried to activate the transponder, but he was out of luck. Lucy Dudko knew what a transponder was. John Killick's cellmate was a con man helicopter pilot, and he told Killick all about the transponder and what it did. If the pilot had gotten the chance to activate it, the device would have created a frequency at Sydney Control Flight Services, alerting them of a hijack. Dudko was well informed. In an instant, she hit the pilot's hand with the handle of her gun. She then turned off the transponder as well as the radio switch. Dudko instructed the pilot to land in the prison exercise area. The man had no other choice. It was either that or death. John Killick watched the helicopter approaching the yard. He was proud. Dudko was indeed a feisty woman. Other prisoners around him watched in awe, either too stunned to move or cheering. Then, most of them ran toward the prison building. Killick made his way toward the helicopter. Once John Gillick got inside the chopper, he was the one to direct the pilot. Killick told Joyce to fly northeast to Macquarie University, about six miles away in Sydney's north, and land on Christine's Oval. Once they landed, Killick tied Joyce's arms and legs with a cord and told him to stay still for a while. Then, Killick and Dudko ran into a nearby bush. They watched Joyce untie himself and go into a nearby clubhouse, where he called the police. The couple then flagged down a car and, holding the driver at gunpoint, made their way to North Sydney, where they met up with some of Killick's old friends. Then, their trace was lost. The news of the prison escape took Sydney by storm. Calls from people claiming to have seen the couple were flooding in daily. Authorities quickly realized Lucy Dudko was the number one suspect in the case. Media loved the story. It was a classic tale of gun-toting lovers, them against the world. The press dubbed Dudko as Red Lucy. The couple were named Australia's Most Wanted. The investigation took officers to Killick's ex-wife, Gloria's apartment. Apparently, Lucy Dudko and Gloria had struck up a friendship, and Lucy had been living in Gloria's apartment since Killick had been in prison. That's where the police discovered pages torn from flight magazines advertising helicopter joyrides over Sydney, and three videos, Hostage, Breakout, and Fled. Dudko had certainly done her homework. It took authorities 45 days to catch John Gillick and Lucy Dudko. On May 8th, the two checked into Bays Hill Caravan Park in Sydney's West, renting a cabin under a false name. Apart from the false name, they'd done little else to disguise themselves. The two had only dyed their hair. Their cover was blown by the caravan park manager. Minutes later, their cabin was surrounded by police officers who used loud hailers to let the couple know their adventure was over. Dudko was convicted on five charges. She received a 10-year sentence. Killick was given a 23-year prison sentence. Their love story refused to die. For years, the couple exchanged more than 4,000 letters and 100 phone calls. They repeatedly made requests for permission to marry, but all of them were refused. Dudko was the one to call off the relationship. While in prison, she embraced religion and decided to move on with her life without Killick. Lucy Dudko was released seven years and two months after the escape. John Killick eventually got out of prison on parole and is now an author with three published books. Back in 2018, Faid staged a spectacular escape, a tour de force which baffled authorities and turned Faid into somewhat of a gangster superstar. It was a Sunday morning in July 2018. While some attended Sunday service, others, namely Red One Faid, were getting ready for a show-stopping prison escape. Faid wasn't a mere petty criminal. He was somebody in the world of crime, a seasoned gangster who took pride in his so-called craft. At 45 years old, the man has spent his entire life involved in some type of illegal activities. Red One Faid was born in 1972 in France to Algerian immigrant parents. He didn't have an easy childhood. In 1988, his father abandoned his family and left Faid's mother to care for 11 children. Three years later, Faid's mother died of cancer. Red One Faid had always loved cinema, particularly gangster movies. When he was a child, Awe-filled by the action-packed thrillers he would watch, Faid swore he would either become a policeman or a thief. At only 19, he was already a delinquent, and so were his brothers. 
They all worked together toward a life of crime. Red One Fade's first big robbery took place in 1990, when he was still a senior in high school. After robbing a bank, he switched to hijacking and robbing armored vans. At that point, he didn't have big plans for the stolen money. Instead, he used the money to impress his friends. Faid wanted to look like he was used to leading a flamboyant life. He wanted to be one of the smooth gangsters he adored when he was a child. In the mid-90s, the man led a criminal gang responsible for everything from armed robbery to jewel theft and extortion. After spending three years on the run, Red One Faid was arrested in 1998 and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was released on parole only 10 years later. Once he was released, Faid wrote a book about his experiences, claiming he was a changed man. Two years later, in 2011, Faid was back in prison, this time with the nickname Levrikan, the writer. But Faid didn't entirely agree with his new eight-year sentence. Sure, he was in fact guilty of planning an armed robbery that had claimed the life of a policewoman, but this didn't mean he had to suffer too, right? That's why, in 2013, he used explosives to blast through five prison doors, while also taking hostages with him. Faid fled the prison using a getaway car, but authorities caught up with him six weeks later. And this time around, they weren't going to let him escape. Or so they thought. On July 1, 2018, Red One Faid was serving his new sentence in the Sud Francilian prison in Rayu, in the Paris region. The stunt he'd pulled back in 2013 by breaking out of jail had gotten him 10 years imprisonment. 18 more years had been added to his sentence for masterminding the 2010 armed robbery in which a young policewoman was killed. This time around, nobody believed Faid had another jailbreak in him. They were wrong. Over the years, Faid had become well-liked in prison. He was always polite to his guards and fellow inmates. He always had that old-time gangster aura about him. But sometimes, the quiet ones are the most dangerous. It was an early Sunday. It was also visiting day in the Sud Francilian prison in Rayu. 45-year-old Red One Faid walked quietly into the visitor's room. One of his brothers, Brahim, was there, waiting to have a little chat with Faid. Everything seemed normal. There was no sign of foul play. Despite this, prison officials were paying close attention to Faid. For some months, there had been several sightings of drones flying over the prison. Authorities immediately had to wonder whether there was a connection between the drones and Faid. For months, officials requested that Faid be transferred to another facility. But by the 1st of July, 2018, the man was still in the same prison, which left guards fearing for their safety. Once he got in the visitor's room, Red One Faid made himself comfortable and started talking to his brother. He knew attracting the guard's attention in any way would put a big dent in his plans. He had to appear unbothered, relaxed. In reality, he was probably more than excited, his body tingling in anticipation. He loved planning moments like this. In fact, he thought of himself as a bit of a filmmaker. Only he wasn't making up a story for the screen. He was altering real life, freezing time, and anticipating any problem that might interrupt his art form. While he talked to his brother Rahim, three other men were carrying out the master plan to help Faid break out of prison. Earlier that morning, Stephanie Bai, a helicopter pilot who had been hired by some tourists to give a ride over the countryside outside of Paris, found himself in a dire predicament. He found himself at the mercy of two gunmen. The gunmen ordered him to obey their instructions, otherwise, they said, Bai's family would be in great danger. To make sure the pilot would cooperate, the gunman told him there was a commando stationed just outside his home, just waiting for the signal to hurt the man's partner and his daughter. The 65-year-old pilot gulped for air. He knew he had no choice but to follow the men's orders. The helicopter took off. Shortly after, it made a quick stop in a field. A third man boarded the helicopter, but not before the gunman loaded what sounded like weapons and other equipment. Once again, the helicopter took off, heading towards Rayu. One of the gunmen told the pilot to land in a triangular courtyard near the prison's main entrance. The prison courtyard was the only area not protected by anti-aircraft netting, mostly because prisoners would use it only to enter and exit the prison. As the helicopter made its descent into the prison courtyard, guards were confused. No one was sure what was happening, not even the prison's central command. In hindsight, nobody believed anyone would be crazy enough to try to pull this kind of stunt. In hindsight, they were wrong. But then something happened. Two armed men wearing black ski masks, paramilitary combat gear, and ski goggles to protect their eyes jumped out of the helicopter and into the courtyard. The men threw smoke bombs and tear gas canisters at all the surrounding buildings. 
Meanwhile, the third man remained inside the helicopter. His gun pointed promptly at the pilot's head. He ordered the pilot to hover the helicopter above the courtyard. Then, they waited. Meanwhile, the two other gunmen used a power saw to open the door leading into the prison building. They both had rifles and were ready to use them at any time. In a matter of minutes, one of the men entered the visitor's room. Fayed followed him. Together, the two men made their way out of the prison building. Nobody dared to prevent them from leaving the building. In fact, nobody was there, not even one guard. Once Fayed got to the helicopter, he knew he had to do one last movie-like gesture. He turned toward the prison and saw two people, a guard and an inmate, watching him from behind a window. Smiling like one of his beloved old-time gangsters, Fayed put his right hand to his temple into a mocking Air Force salute. Then, he was gone. A massive manhunt ensued involving more than 3,000 French police officers. Red One Fayed spent three months on the run before he was eventually caught. He was arrested on Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018, at around 4 a.m. local time. Perhaps his sentimentality was what gave him away. French Special Forces found Fayed in an apartment located in Cray, a city in the northern suburbs of Paris in Fayed's birthplace. After he was finally caught, Red One Fayed was immediately taken to one of France's most secure prisons and placed in solitary confinement. Fayed still won, in a sense. His devotion to becoming a movie-like gangster was rewarded in 2018, shortly after he was arrested. French director Pierre Morel, best known for directing Taken, revealed his intention to direct a Red One Fayed biopic. The Escape of Pascal Payet is an incredible true story that shook the world. It's the story of a daring jailbreak in 2001 when convicted criminal Pascal Payet orchestrated his own escape from a maximum security prison in southern France. With only one accomplice and no outside help, he managed to break out of a facility that had been considered escape-proof for decades. His daring plan was full of clever adaptations and ingenious improvisations making it one of the most daring prison escapes in modern history. This is the story of Pascal Payet's incredible jailbreak, a thrilling tale of intrigue, determination, and sheer audacity. The prison in the village of Luigne in the French department of bouche du rhone is a place steeped in history. It stands as a reminder of a cruel past when prisoners were punished and disciplined with harsh methods. The building has seen many changes over its more than two centuries of operation, but the underlying principles of incarceration remain virtually unchanged. The prison has been used to incarcerate criminals, political dissidents, and wartime prisoners over the years, providing an important insight into how European justice systems operated prior to more modern times. This imposing structure, built with the latest technology and security measures, was once considered the most secure prison in the region, with a reputation for being virtually escape-proof. However, this all changed when the daring escape of Pascal Payet, who became the first prisoner in the history of the Luigna prison to break out. His daring feat captured the imagination of the public and put spotlight on the prison, which was now seen as vulnerable and in need of improvement. The escape of Pascal Payet sparked a heated debate about prison security and the effectiveness of the current system. Pascal Payet is a notorious French criminal known for his spectacular helicopter prison breaks. Pascal Payet was born in the bustling city of Montpellier in France, where he spent his childhood years surrounded by the sights and sounds of the city. However, his family soon moved to the charming city of Lyon, where he spent his formative years. It was here that Pascal Payet first encountered the rough and tumble world of crime, which would later shape his life in ways he never could have imagined. As he grew older, Pascal Payet made his way to Marseille, where he fell in with the wrong crowd. In 1988, he was convicted of a violent crime and sent to prison. Undeterred by his experience behind bars, Pascal Payet continued down the path of crime and was convicted again in 1993 for conspiracy. He participated in a daring attack on the Banque de France armored car in Salon de Provence, during which a guard was tragically killed. Despite the severity of the crime, Pascal Payet continued to evade the authorities until he was finally arrested along with Eric Albareno in Paris in January 1999. From that moment on, Pascal Payet's life would never be the same. He was sentenced to a long prison term and locked up in some of France's most secure facilities. However, even behind bars, Pascal Payet continued to make headlines, 
becoming the first prisoner in French history to escape not once, but twice. Pascal Payet first made headlines around the world in 2001 when he escaped from prison. It was a daring and audacious escape that sent shockwaves across France. Payet had been serving a 30-year sentence for terrorism and murder, but managed to break out of jail using a hijacked helicopter. This spectacular escape involved him being picked up by an accomplice and airlifted away from the prison grounds. Payet then became a legend overnight, making appearances on television shows and in newspapers across the world. In France, he was celebrated as a heroic figure by some people who viewed him as a revolutionary freedom fighter. His escape spawned an international manhunt with police putting out warrants for his arrest. Payet's freedom, however, did not last long. In October of the year 2003, one of his accomplices, Mpoko, was captured and hauled in for questioning in Paris as the authorities were anxious to keep Pascal behind bars. He was eventually spotted and arrested in the same year while visiting a friend in Spain. However, Pascal's determination was not easily thwarted. In April 2003, Pascal masterminded yet another daring helicopter escape, this time freeing Franck Perilletto, Mikhail Valero, and Eric Albareo from the Luinia prison. The three men had been arrested with Pascal in 1999, and he was determined to help them escape to freedom. In a daring operation, the four of them were whisked away by a helicopter, and the authorities were once again left stunned. However, their freedom was short-lived, and they were caught again three weeks later. In January 2005, Pascal was sentenced to 30 years in prison for murder of a guard which took place in 1999, along with the 1997 armored car hijacking in Salon de Provence. Despite being behind bars, Pascal was not content to sit quietly in his cell. In December 2005, he published an open letter in his blog entitled, The Saga of My Transfers, in which he criticized the condition of his imprisonment. He had gone on a hunger strike at a prison in Metz in protest against being transferred nine times in 30 months. His letter was a powerful statement against the harsh conditions of the prison system, and it drew attention to the plight of prisoners like Pascal. By the year 2007, Pascal Payet was one of the most infamous and closely watched prisoners in France. He had earned a reputation as a daring and cunning criminal, and as a result, he was never kept in the same prison for more than six months. To ensure his safekeeping, Pascal was a prisoner who was kept in solitary confinement and was subject to heightened surveillance. Despite the stringent measures taken to keep him behind bars, Pascal kept on planning another escape. On July 14, 2007, the country was celebrating Bastille Day, a national holiday that commemorates the storming of the Bastille Prison in 1789. It was on this day that Pascal and his accomplices executed the most audacious prison break in French history. It was a dark and stormy night in Grasse, France, when all of a sudden the peace was interrupted by a loud roar of a helicopter. In the heart of the celebrations, four masked men hijacked a helicopter from Cannes Mandelieu Airport and made their way to Grasse Prison where Pascal was being held in solitary confinement. Prison guards sprang into action, rushing to the roof of the high security facility to investigate the commotion. The helicopter swooped down, and in a daring move, Pascal was snatched from his cell and whisked away to freedom. Despite the valiant efforts of the guards, the operation was over in just five minutes. And the 43-year-old Payet, who was still serving a 30-year sentence for the murder during an armored car heist in 1999, was nowhere to be found. The helicopter then landed in the town of Brignol, where Pascal and his accomplices fled the scene. The pilot was released unharmed, but the authorities were left stunned. Two days after the daring escape, a European arrest warrant was issued against Pascal Payet. News of his escape spread like wildfire, and people across the country were in shock. A nationwide uproar resulted in Pascal Payet's prison break, and the manhunt for him was one of the largest in French history. Pascal Payet's daring and dangerous escapades were finally brought to a halt in September 2007, when he was captured in the town of Mataro, near Barcelona, Spain. He was transferred to French custody along with his two accomplices and imprisoned in a secret location for security reasons. In June 2008, the criminal court of the Alt Maritime Department sentenced Payet to 15 years in prison, with no chance of early release, for a series of armed robberies and assaults against police officers during his time on the run. And in April 2011, the criminal court of bouche duron added an additional five years to pay its sentence for his 2007 prison escape. His accomplices also faced years in prison, while some other prisoners deemed complicit in the escape received lesser sentences. Despite his infamous reputation, Payet's incredible escapes and criminal exploits had profound effect on the French criminal justice system, 
and on the entire nation. As people were left in awe of his audacity and cunning, his daring feats captured the attention of many. This story was subject to numerous TV shows and articles. The Netflix original, White Rabbit Project, even featured an episode on him, where host Grant Imahara narrated the story while it was reenacted by French actor Thierry Bourard. Payet's story remains an inspiration for those who admire daring and fearless individuals. His legacy as a criminal mastermind and a man who dared to challenge the limits of the law will live on forever. However, his captivation with freedom ultimately proved to be his downfall, as he was brought to justice for his crimes and forced to pay the price for his life of crime.